Right, can you all hear me now? Ah, good. Specifically, can you hear me in the second row? I've noticed everybody, there seems to be a thing. People in the second row are always the hecklers. So I'm, I've been looking, I'm seeing who's in the second row. <laughs> No, <laughs> especially because you're in the third row. Right. Are we starting from zero? Uh, well, <laughs> either way, you're not in the second. <laughs> I'm counting from the back, actually. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm going to be talking about asynchronous programming using futures. Um, so hopefully you're in the right room. Uh, if you wanted to see Toy Soyo, he's, he's in the other room. Um, can I advance these? I cannot. What's going on here? Why can I not? No. Press that one. Okay, there we are. Right. So, first of all, what is our problem? Our problem is that function calls are sort of synchronous. Um, the caller waits for them to return. You call a function, it's going to sit around and wait. Uh, so we can't do anything else while we're waiting. A lot of functions, if, especially if they're performing some kind of I.O., especially network I.O., we want to... We want them to do something kind of in interactive. They're going to take a while before they return. And in the meantime, we can't be doing anything else. It's dead time. Um, we want to talk to an HTTP server. We might be talking to lots of them. And it'd be nice to talk to all of them at the same time and not have to wait for one to reply before we talk to the next. So here's a typical example. We're going to use LWP user agent. And we want to fetch from example.com the very imaginatively named one, two, and three. Um, I did consider having a hack of my slides and calling them Scrooge, Donald, and Huey. But I, I, unfortunately, I couldn't quite fit them in without wrapping. And it, 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 so I didn't. But anyway, um, so I'm sure you'll recognize this kind of structure. We get the first page. Until the first page has returned a result, we can't do anything yet. So we're not going to hit the second line, only to do the next one. Well, all of these are kind of independent. It'd be nice if we, can, if we could do them all more concurrently. So most people have come up with solutions to this, and, and, and they all fit under the general name of asynchronous, whoops, of uh, asynchronous programming. Excuse me while I fall apart here. There we are. Um, so the idea is that what we want to do is start an operation and then return back to the caller while that thing is happening in some vaguely unspecified way. And then later, a result will arrive. So the interesting question becomes, how do we get that eventual result? Um, so people come up with the idea of callbacks a long time ago. And they said, well, if we pass in a code reference into the function, then at some point later when the result arrives, we can invoke that code reference, and that can continue on, and it can receive the result. So here's a, a hypothetical example. We call get on, on this one page, and this function itself is going to return immediately. So if there was any more code down here, bang, straight away, we can do something else. So we could make some more requests. At some point later on, when the response has eventually arrived, it's going to invoke this code reference, and it's going to run it, and it's going to pass in the response here, and it's going to, it's going to print what has, what has happened. And this is sort of all well and good, and, and people kind of recognize these things. But they're not so easy when you start to do more exciting things. Like, how, how would you wait for three things at once? So I tried to write the smallest possible example code that I could get away with. And I think this is it. Um, it's not very nice. Uh, for each of our three pages, we're going to call this function, and we're going to pass in a code ref. And in the code ref, we sort of store the page that we've got. And then here's the interesting line where we say, well, are all of the results in yet? Because there's no point printing until they all are. So if they're not done, then this will return, blah, 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 blah. And eventually, when all three, pay, three results come in, this line gets hit, and we actually print that we've done it. It's, it's kind of long and messy. It's also what I call noisy. It's very hard to see. Really, this line here is the interesting line, because it's, it's telling us what we're going to do. This word here, effectively, is interesting, because it says we're not going to continue until they're all ready. The rest of this code is noise. It is useless. It's, it's, not, it's not telling us anything helpful. We're also not handling things like failures. What happens if one of these pages fails? Um, what happens if we decide, actually, we're not interested in that anymore. Let's, let's stop doing that. This, this function has returned before it's actually finished doing the pages. So there are still ongoing operations. If we decide, actually, we're not interested in that page anymore, stop doing that, we, we can't. We've got no way to do this. So if you'll allow me a, a brief moment to uh, play around with the syntax a bit, we'll eventually arrive at what, what is quite a nice idea. 
So suppose our HTTP get function is really implemented like this, where, oh, I need a ladder, um, where we store this little callback somewhere deep in the guts of our asynchronous HTTP handler. And then uh, we, we send the request. Uh, and, and we do all this, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, then it, and then it can invoke that callback later on. Ah. Um, so we could rewrite this very slightly by this. So rather than passing in a code ref, what we'll do is we'll create this variable called callback. And later on, when the response arrives, we'll call whatever code we happen to find in it. And then we'll return to our caller a ref ref. And we will say, we'll re return a reference to that variable. And then later on, when someone actually tries to use it, they call HTTP get, and that starts the, the, the response. And it's returning this little box here, this, this code ref ref, into which we can store our actual code ref to say, when it arrives, do that. And so it sort of reads slightly nicer, because now we're asking to get that. And then the code that says what we're doing afterwards is down here, as opposed to before, you sort of write it backwards. Um, and also, we could extend it further, and we could say, rather than a, a scalar ref, we could return an array ref, push in lots of handlers, and, and suddenly you can call multiple callbacks at once um, and things. Well, you can sort of extend this idea beyond further and further and further, and you end up at the idea of a future. So the idea of a future is that you call a function to start an operation, and you immediately return some, some box, some opaque thing that represents the ongoing operation. Because once, you've, once you're returning that value, you're back into a similar code shape to the very simple call and return kind of style. Later on, that value can receive the result. So before, when we were just returning, say, a code ref ref or an array ref of, of code refs, there is some magic mechanism that says, here is now your result. And, um, but because we've just got this as a value, we can now use it as a, as a handle on the, the operation as a whole. Because it now represents more than just the idea that later it's going to finish. Because it's a first class thing we can hold. So let's have a look at this actual module. So it's a real module on CPAN, it's called Future. It's a small little piece of, of pure Perl standalone code. It basically just wraps the idea from that sl the, the few slides ago, the idea that you have a list of callbacks and you say, we're going to invoke those later. But it also does a few other bits of magic that are, that are very useful. Um, the future module itself is, uh, su will support s synchronous code as well as asynchronous code. And I will talk about why that is useful in a moment. Uh, and it supports a variety of event systems. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of ongoing idea um, lately that I've noticed that people seem to think that futures are entirely related to iWaysync. They're not. Um, it's a totally generic implementation. Use them on any event systems. Use them on no event system at all. I've got examples of those as well. I will show you all of those. So here's a really simple basic idea. So you create an object. It's a single object that is used by both sides of the, uh, of the, of the thing here, the, the actual called function and the caller. And it looks like this. So this looks remarkably similar to the piece of code we had earlier with the, with the reference reference, where we create this, this object here called future. And then we, we store this piece of code here that says, at some point later on when the res response arrives, we're going to call the done method on it. And we're going to pass it whatever was the result of, of our operation. Um, and really, all that's going to do is invoke all the callbacks that are stored on the object. And then later on, our our function down here, we've, we've asked to get the HTTP um, thing. And we've got this future object that represents that operation. And we can just set a callback on it called by setting on done. And this, this piece of code here works basically identically to the, to the other, earlier one before, but with a lot of extra magic. I will say now, on done is actually evil. Please don't do that for reasons I will explain. So normally, ideally, things are going to succeed. So you call the done method, you provide in the result. The caller is probably going to call get on the future. So it's going to look like this. So we get a future back, blah, 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 blah. And then the caller, at some point, is going to call get. And get will wait 
for, a, respon uh, for a, re a result to be ready. So this is the first time that you see the magic is a little bit more than just list callbacks. Because, for example, what if, what if it turned out that HTTP had already fetched that page a minute ago, and it thinks, actually, I've got that in a cache. I'll just serve it now. Why, why not? Don't need to do any, any I.O. Um, if we just stored a callback list earlier, that wouldn't work. Because the HTTP get function goes, right, well, I'm going to invoke this callback. Oh, there aren't any callbacks. Die. Um, so what the future object does is says, well, even if there aren't any callbacks stored in it yet, you can still call done, and it will store the result. At this point, you now have a future that is already ready. So when anybody else tries to, to call on done or then or anything else on it to say, in, tell me when it's ready, it just goes, actually, it's already ready now. Here, have the result. So that's a nice little bit of magic there. But important to remember is that get will block and wait until the resu result has arrived. And we'll, we'll see later how it does that. Um, and to be honest, you can just write this. And if you end up writing at, at the top level of, of your code, your sort of main.pl style things, you'll probably just do that. Um, and it's the ability to do that 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 I sort of suggest as if all of your interfaces are always just going to return futures, then trivially anyone can just say, oh, well, I'll write a simple synchronous thing by just calling get on it. That's, that's it. Given any asynchronous library, I can write a synchronous program by just sticking trailing get calls. It's really, really simple, but really, really powerful. Because what if it fails? So we have, a, as well as the done method, we have this fail method, and we say, um, whoops, it's failed. So the get method will rethrow it. So here's a little example called action, and actually action always fails. Whoops, never mind. So we just create this future. We immediately set its failure result, because actually we know it's already always failed, return the future. So when the caller tries to call get on it, that just rethrows the exception that was that was stored in here. So suddenly straight away you, you've still got this failure handling. Uh, in a way that would be kind of hard in callbacks. I mean, you, you sort of can do that with a callback, but sometimes you might pass a pair of callbacks, or you'll have a callback that gets passed a special value to say this was a failure, or yeah. Language has exceptions. It's nice if we build them in. We can start to do some more powerful things. Because a future represents an operation. At some point later, it's going to be ready. We attach some code to say, when it's ready, call this action. Well. What if that code itself returned a future? So you've got the idea that you've got an operation that returns a future, and then later on you're going to do another operation that returns a future. Well, that whole operation is an operation that's eventually going to succeed. So you might as well represent that as a future. So you have this, this wonderful method called then, which you should use in preference to ondone. Um, and then says, here's a block of code. When the first one succeeds, call this block of code with the result that it had because it's already succeeded. Pass in that, blah, blah, blah. We expect that to return a future. And this future that comes back represents that whole combination. And so you can just wait for it here, like just calling get. So this is sort of very similar to the, the last one. But because of the fact that we're just returning a future, we can form a longer one. So we could do two requests, say. So we could call the first one, and then when it, when it f returns a response, for example, maybe it was a 301, told us to go somewhere else. So we can just say, well, actually, yeah, OK, I'll just follow the, the location of that, get another one. This returns a future. So this whole future that's returned by the then eventually succeeds after that one is, and then it will call this one. And you can just continue stacking these on. And you will notice there is no more indentation. That lines up there. Anyone who's ever got into the sort of the callback pyramid, as I call it, where you, you pass in a callback, and then a callback, and a callback, and, and it sort of indents, indents, indents. That doesn't happen. It stays in a straight line. Um, it will keep your code editors very happy, because if you, say, have to insert another stage here in your, in your diff output, you've inserted three lines. That's it. You haven't inserted some lines, and then re-indented 50 of them. It makes, makes code review easier. Um, oh, I shall go back a second. So, one thing that it turns out you end up doing quite a lot is capturing, you're sticking on a then block to say, well, something's happened, but actually I'll just return the same result anyway. Um, 
And this thing happened sufficiently often enough that I decided, well, there's no point creating a new future object. Um, I just had this little shortcut. So a lot of the future methods have a with f shortcut that just says, also pass in the future itself, because then you might as well just return that um, if you just wanted to print that something had happened. Um, and that's quite nice. So how does this work with failures or exceptions? That might be a hint. Um, there's this method called else. And um, else is sort of the opposite of then, as any basic programmer will tell you. Um, so we have this sort of future here, and we say, well, try to get that. Um, if we get that, um, try and do this other thing. But if that whole thing fails, call this instead. So suddenly, what we've basically got is a shape that looks a bit like try catch. Because what then will do is, is it will only invoke the code if it got a success. If it got a failure, it will just skip straight over. Um, and go down. So you can end up writing these quite nice blocks that sort of say, do something, then do something else, then something else, then something else, blah, 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 blah. And then just stick an else at the bottom, and that's suddenly a, effectively a catch for the whole thing that says, oh, actually, whoops, it failed. Let's handle it here. And these get very powerful as well. Um, but because these are, these are just function calls, I decided, well, let's, have, let's pass an entire list of things into fail, actually, because that's kind of handy. Because we're talking HTTP, right? So probably, if HTTP fails, we'll get a response back. So it'd be useful to pass the response itself as part of the failure so people can inspect it. So suddenly, you don't need the sort of massively complicated structured exception objects things with all, all craziness. You can just pass a list of values. Shockingly useful. Um, so I mentioned cancellation earlier. So we've got, we've got these future objects that represent something that we're in the middle of doing. It'd be great if we can just cancel it, right? So, um, so we can. We have this very obviously named cancel method. So here's another example. So we've started this HTTP fetch. Um, so that, that returns a future straight away. We get down to here. We enter this try block. We hit this get call. Get call blocks, remember? So we're going to wait here for a while. So eventually, maybe the page will return, the get will return, it'll print this, all is good. Or maybe somebody hits Control c first, and, and we get a sigint, at which point we call cancel. And cancel can tell the HTTP agent, whatever you're doing, stop, drop it, let go, don't do it. And so it's perhaps not so important in HTTP, especially if it's a get. But if you have some sort of long, ongoing operation that could be expensive, um, and somebody's hit the cancel button, you, you don't want to spin more disk, CPU, whatever. It's, it's very useful to be able to stop things. And of course, cancel fully works through sequences. So um, here we have a, a get, um, and we do another get, and we can cancel that. And these things all compose very nicely. Uh, but now we start to get to some more interesting things. Because if you have if you remember the very first, one of the very first slides where I tried to get three pages, the sort of the entire point was that we want to start an operation and let it continue in the background while we do other things, say maybe starting more of them. And if you remember the really complicated code at the beginning that was very difficult to actually wait for all three to happen at once. Uh, sorry, I've, I've said all this already, yeah. So it would be nice if you, if you can start multiple things and wait for all of them. Well, that's an ongoing operation that could succeed or fail. That sounds like a future, right? So let's have one. So we have this wonderful method called wait all. Now, wait all is a, is a constructor on the future class that you give it a list of futures. And it does what it says on the tin. It waits for all of them. And it looks very neat. Get the first one, get the second one, get the third one. These all return futures. Immediately, so we pass them straight into this method called wait all that returns a future straight away They're all going off in the background meantime. We've got this F that is this handle to To know when they're, they're ready we call get that will block until they're all ready. They're all running concurrently eventually they all finish and So we find out which futures were ready and we call get on those individually because we know the whole thing is finished now So that's not going to block at all. That's going to return the result straight away, and we'll get our, our responses Of course, maybe one of the pages failed um, it would be nice to not have to handle that problem. Wait all doesn't stop for exceptions. It's going to wait till they're all ready some way or other. Um, but if we, if we needed all of them to complete anyway, then 
there's no point waiting for, say, 10 operations if the first one immediately fails. You might as well just not bother. Mm, that sounds like cancelling. Um, so we have this even nicer method called Needle. And it looks even neater. It returns a future that will succeed once all of them have succeeded, uh, completed successfully. It will fail the moment any of them fail. And um, it looks even neater. Do three concurrent gets, pass them into needs all. Here we have a future. And then because we know that they've all succeeded, we can just call get. And what the needs all future does is says, well, I know that they've all succeeded, so from get, I'll immediately return a list of all of the individual results. So you just sort of merge them all together. And that looks really neat. That looks so much neater than the original example we had with all of the callbacks and the hash that remembered if they're all done, blah, 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 because we've moved all of the machinery out. There's no machinery here. There's no noise. This is also a lot more powerful, because as well as the original callback one, the moment any of these fails, we decide, well, three's failed. Um, let's cancel one and two and cause the whole operation to fail. It will cancel the ones that it now no longer needs because it's, it's failed. That's really useful. Uh, where are we? Oh, I've said that. I've said that. Yeah, yeah, go away. Yep. Sometimes we also need a needs any operation. Um, it's sort of the exact opposite of needs all. It will succeed as soon as anything is ready. Um, but if one of them fails, well, it says, well, don't worry, because I only needed one of these to succeed. Don't worry about that failure. Keep, keep going. So, for example, we might decide to, to do mirroring. Say, well, we'll try and get our page from example.com, but I happen to know that mirror service and mirror site also have copies of it. I'll, I'll try and fetch them from over here. If one of them fails, it doesn't matter. As long as one of them succeeds, it will be fine. And so the needs any is going to re return the moment any of them succeed. And as soon as one of them succeeded, there's no point running any of the others, so you might as well cancel them, right? So that gets really powerful. And then finally, you have the fourth combination, which is called wait any, which uh, just waits for all of these futures. And the moment any of them does anything, it says, right, I'll take that result, cancel all the rest. And it's very useful for timeouts. Because this is a very powerful structure. HTTP get might return a page, might not. So let's, let's have this new function called timeout. And we say, after 20 seconds, if you're still running, fail. So this, this thing here returns a future that's going to fail in 20 seconds. So now it's just a race. Who's going to win? Maybe the page will return first and succeed, at which point this will succeed. Maybe the timeout will happen, at which point this fails, the whole thing fails. Whichever one is ready first, the other one gets cancelled. So suddenly, we have the automatic ability to add timeouts to any function at all. Turns out that's really useful. Now I'm going to start going down the route of things that Perl's future has uh, that I got annoyed that I couldn't find in any other future or promises or deferred or whatever um, implementations, and, and I created. So some of these don't have very nice names necessarily because I've started inventing them. But one of the, one of the really nice things you want to be able to do is write a loop, because, hey, we like writing loops, right? Um, so we have this module called Future Utils. So it has a bunch of these useful utilities. So we have a wrapper to run piece of code. Um, so when you're running a loop, you've got a function that's going to return a future. You're running it a bunch of times, waiting for it to eventually succeed. Well, that's an ongoing operation. That kind of sounds like a future. Mm. So it's future. Uh, so, so we have this function called repeat that, funnily enough, returns a future that represents running this code repeatedly until it succeeds. So we have an example. Um, and obviously, we don't want to repeat until the end of time. We, it'd be nice to have a, a function to, to tell us when it's ready. So here's our little example. So we're going to start at 0, and we're going to increment the ID. We're going to try and get this page. And if it returns successfully, because it's returned 200, that should probably be a regex test or something, because it might return 201 or something. Never mind. Um, Succeeds. Oh, it succeeded. Let's go round again. Let's go round again. Let's keep going round until it fails. This kind of looks pretty much like a while loop. It's basically a while loop. But the whole operation, the, this whole function call, has just returned immediately with the future. And that's going to sort of carry on running uh, when we call get. And then eventually we'll stop, and the get will, will, will stop, having fetched all our pages. Um, rather than a while loop, we have these sort of for loops. Um, because they got useful as well. Um, so you can provide um, 
a list of things to operate on. Um, you can combine it with wild conditions as well. So here's an example with an array ref. Um, so rather than repeat while, we say repeat for each, because maybe we've got a whole bunch of things we're going to put somewhere. So we have this list of keys, and we're going to walk this, this repeat loop, repeatedly putting things out of the array. And then when this runs out, it goes, oh, I've got nothing left to do. This operation succeeds. And if at any point in the middle it failed, the whole thing will fail, and it will just stop. So we can do for loops. Repeat, you might have noticed, doesn't have any kind of concurrency. Well, again, the whole point with futures was that we like doing concurrent I.O. So there's no point waiting for one put before we perform the next one. We might as well do some concurrency. Um, yeah, that's what I just said. Um, so we have this thing. I was going to call it map, but then it breaks too much syntax if you ever create a function called map. So I had to call it fmap for future map. Um, but never mind. Uh, so it sort of looks like this. Uh, no? It looks like this. There we are. Um, looks remarkably similar to the previous one. fmap for each, say, one, one to 200. So we're going to get 200 pages. But we want to get five of them at once. So now we're going to get 200 pages, five at once. And all the results are going to come back in a list in this order. So it, it makes sure that even if the pages don't come back in the right order, it's going to put them in the right order when it returns here. So, so from here, we're going to get a list of 200 responses to all of these requests in the right order, done five at once concurrently. Starting to look quite powerful. Haha. -ha. So I said at the beginning, by some vague hand-wavy mechanism, these things run in the background. I also said at the beginning, these things are basically just a list of callbacks and a result if it's already succeeded. Um, there's no magic going on here. A plain future on its own, literally from the future class, doesn't know how to wait. If you, uh, if you were to literally do this code, it fails like that. It says it's not yet complete and does not provide an await method. Ha ha. So future on its own needs a bit of help. Uh, ooh, that's an excitingly different way to draw the slide. Um, so with IOA sync, you have an event loop, so we can perform some waiting. So we can write some code here. Um, we have to construct the loop, because that's how IOA sync works. And the loop has this wonderful method called delay future, and that returns a future that's going to wait for three seconds. And when that future is ready, we call this, this then method. Um, and then done is another little helper method, because quite often it turns out that you write a, a then that just says then sub return a future with a constant value in. Well, that's just a little shortcut. It says, well, I don't want to run some code. I just want to run, wait for this future. The moment it's finished, return with this result. So then done is, is, is a nice little shortcut. So what this says is wait for three seconds and then return this string so we can print what it does. And so we run it, and it waits, and it waits, and it says, hello world. It's very exciting. But you can do them with any event. So you can write this code that looks very, very similar. Any event future, new delay after three seconds. When it's done, send hello world, and then print it. And funnily enough, it does. But we can also do them with Poe. As of literally the start of the conference, I wrote it on the plane on the way over. Um, looks remarkably similar again. Do delay, wait for three seconds. Um, I decided to follow the Poe style of um, function call syntax, where it's, it's basically positional arguments, uh, yeah, positional arguments rather than named arguments, um, because it, it seemed a bit nicer in a sort of a Poe world. Um, so there's new delay and there's new alarm uh, for al absolute versus relative times. Um, it just sort of stays within the, the culture a bit more. But again, very similar idea. Wait for three seconds, then, then say hello world. And uh, it, I doubt it will surprise anyone to know it, that it does indeed wait for three seconds and then says hello world. Um, so it's agnostic to the event system. Uh, so once you've got one of these future objects that, you're, that you, you've called a function, it's returned you some kind of future. You don't know what kind of future it is, but you don't care. 
You can just call await on it. You can call get on it. You can call then. You can stick it in a future util loop. So you can basically write code that performs all sorts of fancy asynchronous work without actually caring what kind of event system you've got. Um, so for example, I've, I've written uh, the async Amazon S3, which uh, talk, uh, sorry, N N async Web Service S3, that so talks to the Amazon S3 system. Uh, and that's ba built entirely on futures. Uh, by default, if you construct one of these things, it will construct itself a net async HTTP user agent. But it doesn't actually care about, about IO async. You could, you could just construct one with an any event HTTP um, client that happens to return futures. You could do a PO one. You could wrap LWP user agent in a very, very tiny piece of code that just returned immediate futures, and it would still work. So I've written one module that actually works four times for four different things. So why bother picking an event system? Just use a future, and then it doesn't care. So in summary, we have a set of building blocks that we can combine futures into other futures. It turns out that over the past few slides, I've given you all of the control flow that Perl has. All of it. You can sequence statements by using then. You can handle exceptions that look like try-catch with, uh, with these little else's. At some point, I'm going to add a catch method that, that can inspect and only catch particular types of exception as well. That would be very useful as well. Um, so this, this could end up looking even neater. You can do conditionals with the, uh, the then with f. Um, you have to kind of write your logic a bit backwards, but you, you do the first operation, and you go then with f, and you say, well, if the condition doesn't hold, I'll just return the future that I got given anyway. Otherwise, I'll call this function and, and do something else. So you can do these conditionals. You can do while loops with repeat while. You can do while loops that put the condition first, and I have struggled to find any syntax neater than this. Um, and it would be really nice if there was one, but I, there's a slight complication in that if you call the body, if, if, you, if the condition is already false, you don't call the body at all, which means that you haven't got a future out of the body to return to your caller yet. So you sort of have to call it the first time to know what you're going to return back. Um, otherwise, we would just sort of do that. Um, and also, Perl gets away with having a condition at the beginning or the end by just swapping the order of the keywords. But these just being named parameters that come out in a hash, I can't, I've got nothing to swap the order on. Um, I've tried various ideas to make that neater. Um, I haven't found one that I like yet, so sorry about that. Uh, we have for each loops. They look very, very similar. We have map that looks very similar. But there's more. Because immediately we have concurrency. So immediately we can do all of these exciting operations, these, these things that I call convergent code flow, where we say, wait for multiple things to happen at once and then handle a the result when they've all done. I mean, that, that was sort of the core entire reason for doing this. We've also got the concurrent map, where we can perform some, some function over a, over a list independently multiple times. We've also got cancellation. We can just stop things. All of these building blocks fully support cancellation. You, you can cancel a, a needs all or, or whatever, and it will cancel all the components that aren't ready yet. You can cancel an F map, and it will say, oh, well, I'll stop all the ones that are currently running and just stop there. You can, you can cancel everything. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, we also have exceptions with values, um, because rather than waiting for Perl to define acceptable objects, I just thought, hey, screw it, return the list. It's fine. Um, so you can, you can provide all, all this extra context. Um, now I'm a bit ahead of where, <laughs> I'm a bit ahead of where I thought I'd be at, at a mere 33 minutes. So I'm going to skip ahead to the bonus slide, because I often get asked for what what, what about future makes it hello. Oh well, I'm going to come back. Oh well, I can always repeat the question. If you if you've preempted my question. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. Hello. Oh, no. Technology is hard sometimes, you know. There we are. Is it good? Ah, yeah, there we are. Hi. Hello. Do you support nested for loops? Nested for loops. Nested for loops, totally, absolutely. Because it, the, the last step is very different, the callback. 
Pardon? The last step of the, nest, the internal for loop is very different than uh, yes. the other loops. Yes, well, this, this was the whole point I was saying earlier, was that once you have the idea of a future representing an operation, then all of your building block functions that combine these things together are performing an operation that itself returns a future. So there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't put an fmap inside a while, inside a... Yeah, you can totally combine them together all the time. Well, there are some very tricky corner cases. Um, they're a sort of. We'll, we'll, we'll get it. We, we can discuss that, I think. But I'll, I'll get on to this first. Um, so, um, so, yeah, uh, people often ask me sort of co comparisons against other... Um, other things that are like this. Uh, the principal one being promises. So people say, what's the difference between a promise and a future? Um, the answer to that is basically nothing. Um, futures were invented in the 70s by uh, a bunch of Lisp people, and promises were invented in the 70s by a bunch of functional programmers in a different language. Um, and they'd basically both invented the same idea, and because it was so interesting and new and unique, they thought, oh, I'm going to give it a wonderful new name. And so they both did. Um, and so... The, the concepts of a future and a promise are two names for the same idea. There, there is no difference. Um, but specifically, the C panel called promises is an implementation of the node or the JavaScript promises spec. So it has a simpler API. Um, it doesn't spot cancellation at the moment. Uh, it doesn't have the future utils wrappers. Um, it's not on the list there, but also it doesn't have all four of the convergent functions. It's only got a, a function to uh, basically the same as wait all. So it doesn't have the way to say, I need all of these things to succeed. The moment any of them fails, please stop. It, just, it doesn't have that. Um, but it's very simple to uh, implement it because it's three lines of code. Um, it is, yes. Yeah, future.pm is about a thousand lines of code. Um, Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the, the comment was that um, it's, it's easier to implement. Um, it is easier to implement in a way, but it also isn't that easy as compared. Um, the, the two are very similar. Um, the Promises API in particular, when I say it's simpler, I don't mean it's simpler at all. I mean it has fewer methods. Um, um, the Promises author sort of looked at the, um, the future API and he said, oh my god, this is, this is horrible. There's like 20 methods here. Um, and I thought, well... I could tell you a piece of paper to stick over the screen to hide the methods that you're not interested in, for example. Because, for example, he, he, he objected to, to then done. He said, well, why do you need then done? You can just pass in a code ref that immediately returns the result. And I said, well, yes, you can, and most people probably could do. But if you want to run 100,000 of these concurrently at high speed, every optimization is really useful. Um, the other thing that Promises does is because it follows the, 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 um, the JavaScript API, their then functions are slightly different. From a then block, you can return a promise, and it waits for that promise as, uh, uh, to complete. Or you can, if, if the thing you return is not a single promise, then it will wrap that in an immediately succeeded promise and, and return that. And I dislike that kind of magic, that way that says, call this function, maybe I'll return a single value that's a future, or maybe I won't, and if I don't, you ought to wrap that in a, in a thing. I, I dislike it because I, I think it's a bit messy. Um, it can lead to some very subtle bugs where you think you're returning a future, but you're not, and, and so on. So, so I don't support that. So Promises has some, some ways to do that. Um, so it's not actually that different. Um, and it's not actually that, that much simpler. Also, um, they, Promises doesn't support cancellation, um, but the actual JavaScript people are busily arguing about the semantics of cancellation, so he's going to have to add it to Promises anyway, at which point it really will be very similar to Future. Um, another thing that you might notice these are very similar to is the convars in, in uh, any event. Um, they're really not. Uh, CVs can't fail, they can't be cancelled, they can't converge, they don't have sequencing, they don't have utilities. The only thing you can do with a convar is wait for it to succeed and get the result of it when it has. So they're a lot more powerful than convars. Um, and I just have enough time for this one. Uh, oh, and also convars are not agnostic to event systems, they only work with any event. Uh, whereas as I've explained already, futures work with anything, or no event system at all. Um, I recently wrote um, a wrapper for this wonderful little piece of um, debugging electronics hardware called a bus pirate. And um, I wrote bus pirate 001, stuck that on CPAN, and I thought to myself, you know, I should um, practice what I preach, I should write this on futures. So I sort of took the code and I shuffled it around and I made it work on futures in the same number of lines of code as it originally had. 
and it really wasn't any different, but suddenly it was using futures um, by just providing its own internal implementation of a future that is actually synchronous, it just waits for the file handle. Um, but suddenly you can actually wrap that for any of the event systems by just passing in the futures from that event system that know how to wait, and it will just work. Um, so suddenly, again, I've written four modules once, which is really useful. And finally, I'm going to talk about something that isn't Perl. Um, some people might be aware of uh, Twisted from Python, which is their, one of their asynchronous event systems. Um, and they have a thing called a deferred, which they, they, they say is like a future. Uh, it, it isn't. Um, deferreds made one very fundamental design flaw. Um, a future just stores a list of callbacks. Uh, if it's not ready yet, it will just store those. The moment you tell it, here's your result. It goes down those list of callbacks and invokes them all with the result. That means if you have a future, you can just add a then call on it, or an undone or whatever, and be informed of the result. And it doesn't matter if other people are also interested in that result. So you can use futures as a sort of message bussy thing to say, call a module to, a, to get a future that will contain a result, and then immediately call a, a thing on it. You could do that as a cache. You could say, well, if it's something like a DNS system, you can just store a big hash of futures that, that will eventually contain the result for any DNS request. But if you've already made that request once, you've already got the future in the cache, you can just return that future. If it's already got its result, bang, instantly somebody else has got it. So the, this is, turns out to be a really useful function. Um, the deferred from, from uh, Python's Twisted, you put in the first callback, and when you, when you invoke the, the deferred, it calls that callback. Whatever that callback returned is passed to the second callback. Whatever that one returns is passed to the third callback. Because they say, well, you know, you can perform sequencing logic like that. Um, but everybody else with the futures and the promises and, and everybody, everybody else's implementations do that with a method called then. Uh, whereas the deferreds are unique in that you basically cannot safely trust any deferred that you haven't directly created because you don't want to upset anybody else. You, you can't just get in, in in the middle or, or, or at the end or whatever because you don't know what state it's going to be in. So it turns out they're not actually very useful. Um, and they also, again, don't have utils. Um, they do have some converging stuff. That's quite good. They have cancellation. They, they have failure. So they do have most of these things. But again, they don't have utils. Um, I've also used some Java futurey things um, at, uh, at Google, and again, they don't really have any utils things. Um, I, I don't think I've seen futurey things that have easy ways to do for loops, while loops, concurrent maps, that kind of thing. Um, and I don't know why, it's very useful. Um, so I think I'm about at the end there. Um, there was one more thing I'm sure I was going to say, but I've, I've forgotten it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, well, I'll go back, to my, uh, go back to my previous slide. So I was supposed to end here, but apparently I just talked faster. So um, there's the module. Um, I wrote, uh, I wrote uh, an, an advent calendar for, for Christmas last year. So there are 25 little slides about futures um, that, that sort of start off nice and simple with little synchronous things and, and end up building up to a, a very nice large example of all the kinds of things you want to do. So if you want to read lots more examples, there are 25 fun and exciting examples on my on my code blog there. Uh, that's also linked from the, the future module itself. Um, I think that's it. Any questions? Not, not a second row question, I notice. No, but from row two. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. That's a whole other argument. So, so you claim that the future system is uh, event system uh, agnostic, mm. which is true from the user's side of uh, mm. things. But if I write a, uh, a module mm. uh, which uh, returns features, that module will be tied to the event system that I am using. So you can't mix modules with different event systems. We know the troubles with that. Um, you sort of can, sort of can't. So um, one thing I didn't, uh, one thing I've sort of glossed over, is that. Uh, all of the sequencing methods, for example, like the then and the else and so on, will return a future of the same class as the original thing you passed in. Similarly, all of the convergence and, and all of that, the, the, that, will, that will work out the best class of future to return. So in, as I mentioned, the um, uh, web service S3, when, when you construct a web service S3 object, you can give it a user agent. 
and the user agent is in an object that has a get method, and you expect that the, sorry, capitals, get, and you pass get a URL, and you expect it to return a future that at some point will return the result response. And the rest of the module is entirely built on calling that and then sequencing it. So, so this module really is agnostic. If you, if you wrap LWP user agent in a method that returns immediate futures, pass that in, it will just work. If you wrap the any event HTTP client with a method that just returns an any event future, pass that in, it will just work. Hmm? If you've already written a module. Well, obviously, yes. If you've already written a module that doesn't use futures, then it's not immediately going to work. Um, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, if, if you write some code, and in your code you are calling any event or post specific features, then yes, you've written a module that is any event or post specific. I, I, I can't prevent that. Yes, but, but you can't mix that with other modules then that do the same thing, but with another event system. Well, so is, there a, way, you is can. there a way to provide the event system from the outside, apart from wrapping everything? Well, yes, you just pass them in as constructors. But, but I mean, now you're down to a sort of generic dependency injection or um, generic coding thing. I mean, that's nothing to do with futures. That's just try not to uh, try to inject your dependencies from outside. So, so never have the code construct timer futures or file handle waiting futures or anything else like that. Provide them a factory by which they can do so. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, that, that turns out to be quite useful. Um, anyone else? Oh, another one. Let's, uh, send the mic over. We should get one of those crane mics, so we can just sort of boom it round. Uh, okay, just... Um, okay, say you've started an operation, and then at some point in the future you decide to cancel it. Mm. Uh, what happens if that operation needs to do some cleanup when right. it's cancelled? Does the cancel call block, or is there a way to find um. out later when it has cleaned up? Oh, um, I, I deferred cancel. Um, right. So when you when you so on on a future object, there's a there's a method called on cancel, and you can pass in a code block to say if somebody cancels this, run this cleanup code. Um, currently, that's all um, that's all ignored. So yeah, the the cancel will just immediately invoke all of those, and then just sort of forget about it. So yeah, if your if your cleanup takes some amount of time. Um, I mean, if your cleanup takes some amount of time, you've effectively got a thing that's sort of more like a transaction. Um, I mean, because I have been considering some sort of subclass, perhaps, of, of future, where you can build a transaction out of multiple steps. And at every step, you also provide it a sort of a rollback step. And so if it fails somewhere in between, it's going to roll back. And obviously, those could take some time. But yeah, currently, cancel won't. There's no way to wait for it to finish canceling. We, we presume that cancel is just close file handles, do, do something, do whatever. But it shouldn't be very expensive, canceling. Yeah. Right. Um, oh, another one. We have about two minutes, but uh, it's a good thing I talk fast. Yeah. Uh, in your future uh, object, uh, if I understand, uh, you mix the consumer and uh, producer yes. side of the asynchronous operation. Mm. Do you think it is a good idea? Um, right. So uh, C++ has a fairly standard um, promise-y, future-y, deferred-y type thing, uh, where you call a function that returns two objects. One for the caller, one for the callee. Um, and it, it feels almost a bit like socket pair, uh, not socket pair, a uh, pipe, in that you've got these two objects that are interconnected. You pass one one way, one the other. So in C++, it makes a lot of sense, because C++ strictly typed language, uh, statically typed language. So each of your objects, obviously the caller should only be providing a result, shouldn't be trying to wait on it. Uh, sorry, the, the, the callee should only be providing yes. a result. And so you can get your compiler to check that people are only calling the right methods. But basically, every dynamic language that implements futures, promises, deferreds, whatever, just kind of says, yeah, let's not bother with that, because you just stop, shouldn't stop, be calling the wrong stop, methods. Stop, stop, stop. Uh, mm. If you have any implementation of promises, then mm. your asynchronous operation has two ends. One is deferred, and one is uh, promise. Uh, on promise, you can call then, but you cannot resolve the promise. 
Yeah. The other end is uh, kept uh, uh, in at the uh, producer side. So mm. you have no way to, uh, how to resolve uh, your promise. Uh. Yeah, I, I, it's mostly just a, a static safety thing. I, I just, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it makes sense to me in, in Perl to create two objects just so that you can restrict that people don't call the wrong methods. I mean, if you call, if you call HTTP get and it returns a future and you call done on that, that future will succeed with whatever result you've, you've called it. Yes, um, probably the HTTP method will get a bit confused. Well, don't do that. Um, it's, it, it's not a very Perlish thing to suddenly say, I'm going to give you two objects with a subset of methods just to stop you calling the wrong ones. It's, I, didn't, I didn't like that as a design. No. Yeah. I think we're probably about done then. Um, well, thank you very much.